Hello, I am Somnath Das Gupta. I teach at Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi. In this module, we will talk about the metamorphism of pelletic rocks. But before we go there, I have to give you an introduction starting from the concept of metamorphic fascis. As you know, pressure and temperature are the more, most important variables of metamorphism. However, metamorphic mineral assemblages are very strongly controlled by the bulk composition. That is to say, the composition of the protolith. For this purpose, actually, Escola defined the concept of metamorphism uh, nearly 180 years before. A metamorphic fascist is defined as a set of metamorphic mineral assemblages repeatedly occurring in space and time, so that there is a predictable correlation between chemical composition and mineral composition. So, Escola identified that bulk composition plays a pivotal role in deciding about the nature of mineral assemblages in metamorphic rocks. Now, we have several metamorphic fascias which are diagrammatically shown in PT space in figure 1. So, in figure 1, you will see a rough disposition of the different metamorphic fascias in PT space. And in light blue lines, I have drawn the metamorphic fascia series as well, where you can see that the line A is represents the high pressure fascia series, line B the medium pressure fascia series, and line C is the low pressure fascia series. From this figure, it becomes very clear that the series of metamorphic fascias developed in rocks will be quite different if the metamorphic field gradients are different. This is something that you need to keep in mind while interpreting the natural occurrences in the field before coming to any conclusion about pressure temperature domain of metamorphism. In 1960s, a dramatic development in metamorphic petrology saw the incoming of the concept of metamorphic fascia series. This was done by Miyashiro in his landmark work. Metamorphic fascia series was, is defined as a series of metamorphic fascias in a particular metamorphic terrain. Now, why is it necessary to distinguish different metamorphic terrains? This is because that each metamorphic terrain has a characteristic ambient metamorphic field gradient, which varies from one terrain to another. And the series of metamorphic fascias developed in a terrain is a function of the ambient field gradient. Miyashiro identified broadly three different types of metamorphic fascia series, which he called low pressure, medium pressure, and high pressure fascia series. Now, we will see that the nature of metamorphic fascia varies in different metamorphic fascia series, and as a result, the metamorphic mineral assemblages also vary in different fascia series. This is a big complications. Now, another point that you must remember before I start discussing about metamorphism of pelletic rocks, that we will talk about mineral transformations during metamorphism. How does transformation occur? They occur in response to simple chemical reactions. So, the controlling factors of a chemical reaction will be applicable to metamorphism as well. Metamorphic mineral reactions are basically of two types. The one is a solid, solid transformation, which constitutes only 5 percent of metamorphic reactions, and the rest of the 95 percent metamorphic reactions are actually involving a fluid phase. So, they are solid fluid equilibria. 
With these few words as an introduction, we are now going into the metamorphism of pelletic rocks per se. So now coming to the pelletic rocks proper. What are pelletic rocks? Pelletic rocks were originally shell or siltstone type sedimentary rocks and they contain minerals like quartz, feldspar, lot of white mica and lot of clay minerals. Chemically, the co composition can be expressed in the system KF mash, so to say K2O, FeO, MgO, Al2O3, SiO2, H2O. Now, within this system, the pelletic rocks vary widely in composition, but all are characterized by very high Al2O3, SiO2 and K2O, variable FeO and MgO, but invariably low CaO. Very broadly speaking, pelletic rocks can be divided into two compositional groups. One is called low alumina pellite and the other a high alumina pellite. In a typical AFM diagram, low alumina pellite will be plotted below the garnet chloride tie line and the high alumina pellite will be plotted above the garnet chloride tie line. Now, in figure 14.3, I have shown you a typical phase diagram in the system KF mesh where all the possible mineral reactions are plotted. As you can see, with increasing pressure and temperature, one will encounter a sequence of min reactions, but the nature of mineral reactions will be different along the PT gradients shown as blue arrows, the three metamorphic field gradients of Miyashiro. You can see that rocks metamorphosed under medium pressure Fashi series will not experience the same kind of mineral reactions as those in the low pressure Fashi series. This is the uniqueness of the concept of metamorphic Fashi series. Given in this background, let us now discuss the most well studied metamorphism of pelletic rocks along the medium pressure Fashi series which is also known as Barovian metamorphism. Now why Barovian? The reason is Barrow first documented it from Scotland way back in early 1900. So after such a long time still the observations of Barrow are valid and which Barrow showed that in Scotland with progressive metamorphism, different mineral zones are developed, starting from the chloride zone at the lowest PT, followed by respectively biotite zone, garnet zone, storolite zone, kyanite zone, and selenite zone at the highest PT. Now, in the chloride zone, pelletic rocks contain chloride, white mica, muscovite, uh, potash feldspar and quartz mainly. In the biotite zone, chloride, potash feldspar, they react to produce biotite. So biotite makes its appearance in the biotite zone in pelletic rocks. Both the chloride zone and biotite zone fall within the green schist fascias of Escola. At the beginning of the amphibolite fascis, we have the garnet zone in the Barovian zonal sequence, where the low alumina pellite will develop garnet. Garnet appears through breakdown of chloride and muscovite. And you must note here that a very special type of garnet called spacetine garnet, which is manganese rich can develop in the biotite zone given the original high manganese content in the bulk composition. But otherwise, 
normal iron magnesium garnet will make its appearance in the garnet zone. In the high alumina pellite on the other hand, we will not see garnet, but we will see chloritoid. This is followed by the storolite zone. In the storolite zone, in the high alumina pellite, we get chloritoid breaking down to uh, storolite and storolite makes its appearance in the uh, low alumina pellite also from the breakdown of chlorite and muscovite and also partially from the breakdown of garnet. By this time, we have reached a temperature of around 550 degrees Celsius and 5 to 6 kilobar. At the subsequent high higher metamorphic zone, that is the kyanite zone, the storolite starts to break down to produce kyanite in both low alumina pellite and high alumina pellite. Kyanite being an aluminous mineral will be more abundant in a high alumina pellite, but the distinction between low alumina pellite and high alumina pellite becomes fuzzy at this grade of metamorphism. The kyanite zone is reached at around 600 degrees Celsius and 6 to 6.5 kilobars. After the kyanite zone comes the selimanite zone approximately at 650 degrees Celsius and 6 or 6.5 kilobars. Here kyanite can be partially changed into selimanite by the polymorphic transformation kyanite to selimanite or else selimanite will appear from the breakdown of the rest of the storolite which were preserved till then. Following the selimanite muscovite zone, we have a zone which is called selimanite potash felspar. The silimanite potash felspar isograd is characterized by the breakdown of muscovite. So we are no longer getting muscovite in the rock. Muscovite breaks down to potash felspar plus silimanite plus water in the presence of quartz. So now you see that potash felspar was present in the chloride zone, but nowhere in the biotite, garnet, storolite, kyanite and normal selimanite zone. But now at this condition potash felsfer makes a reappearance in the pelletic rocks and we are bordering into the granulite fascias at this stage. Now suppose I increase the temperature farther, then what happens? Now the pelletic rocks become partially molten and what are the minerals they melt. These are both muscovite and then biotite. Muscovite melts first followed by biotite. But we distinguish two types of melting reactions which are described, which are shown in uh, figure 14.8. The first stage we have a fluid present melting and in the second stage we have a fluid absent melting. So summarizing both muscovite and biotite melt, but first muscovite and secondly biotite. And first melting is in the presence of fluid and in the second case it is in the absence of fluid. The melt produced in amount is much more during biotite melting. More than 20 percent of the rock can be partially molten. But in case of muscovite melting, only 5 to 10 percent of melt can be generated. Now, partial melting has a different name also, a nomenclature. This is called anatexis. Anatexis means partial melting and pelletic rocks, when partially molten due to the process of anatexis, produce a rock which is called migmatite. You can see a photograph of a big matite in figure 14.7 where you can see that the rock is a composite rock containing light layers 
the light layers are of granitic composition and dark layers which are called melanosomes which contain mainly the ferromagnesian minerals. You can easily notice a lot of garnet in those uh, melanosomes. The light layers are called leucosomes. So at this stage, well within the granulite fasces, what do we have in epilytic rock? We have quartz, plagioclase feldspar, potash feldspar, selamanite, garnet with or without biotite. In India, we often call this rock as condalite. You might have heard about this rock, condalite. This is a granulite fasces metapelytic rock. We can still raise the temperature, but that will be the subject of another module where we will talk about metamorphism under extreme conditions. Now, let us look at what happens when we metamorphose a politic rock in the low pressure fascist series. Or this fascist series has got different names. Some people call it Abukoma-type fascist series. Some people call it Bukhan-type fascist series. Whatever may be the name, the important point to note is that kyanite, garnet, and storolite, all the common minerals in the Barovian fascist series we discussed just before, they do not appear in Bukhan type or Abukoma type or low pressure fascist series. Instead, what do we get? We get andalusite at lower temperature of the aluminosilicate polymorph, which changes to silimanite at higher temperatures. And you can have lot of cordurite under such circumstances. Then we look at the high pressure fascist series metamorphism. Now the names of the fascists are even different. We start with the geolite fascists, changes to prehnite, pumpelliite fascists, followed by blue schist fascists, and then finally to eclogite fascists. The pelletic rocks in the blue schist fascists contain the minerals talc and fengite. Now these minerals are both colorless as a result of which the rock is colorless and we call it white schist. It's completely different from the uh, green schists that you must have come across. So white schists appear in the blue schist fascist uh, metamorphosed pelletic rocks. In the eclogite fascists, lot of changes occur in the pelletic rocks. Magnesium rich garnet and kyanite and rutile are the major minerals there along with quartz. But in eclogite, we do not have plagioclase. Plagioclase decomposed, decomposes at the boundary of the eclogite, producing different minerals. We will further explore this kind of metamorphism in a separate module. So what did we observe during the last few minutes? We learned that metamorphism has got a very important variable in addition to pressure and temperature, that is the bulk composition. We also learned that metamorphic field gradient represented by metamorphic fascist series will decide what will be the series of metamorphic fascists in a terrain. Or in other words, what will be the series of minerals developed in pelletic rocks in different terrains. They can be quite different depending on the same difference of metamorphic field gradient. So what happens? We are really, we are handling a very complicated situation, pressure, temperature, bulk composition, metamorphic field gradient, all interplay with each other to produce the diverse metamorphic mineral assemblages that we observe in pelletic rocks. You need to be really, really careful to do that. In this recent years, we are using 
more of pseudo sections rather than phase diagrams to understand the stability fields of mineral assemblages in pelitic rocks. Which I have given some figures in the text 14.6 and 14.9 where pseudo sections are represented. You can look at the pseudo sections. What is a pseudo section? A pseudo section is a phase diagram for a particular bulk composition, so to say for a particular rock and should be applicable strictly for this particular rock only. But if you look at the pseudo sections carefully, you will see that the sequence of mineral reactions are very, as I discussed in this presentation, are very beautifully developed in figure 14.6 and even in 14.9 you can see the melting reactions which I have discussed earlier uh, while uh, talking about muscovite and biotite melting. So these pseudo sections help us in a great way to understand the pressure temperature stability limits of the different mineral assemblages. Here I have shown you in pelitic system, but the similar phase diagrams can be shown in other uh, rock types as well. So in summary, what did we learn today in this presentation? We learned that metamorphism can be a really a complicated process. For example, the general two important variables like pressure and temperature are not sufficient to understand the evolution of metamorphic rocks. You need to take into consideration the bulk composition. You need to take into consideration the metamorphic field gradient in a particular terrain. As you will see that the nature of mineral reactions and the nature of mineral assemblages produced in the Barovian facies series is not the same as that produced in the high pressure facies series. So taking all these things into consideration, we have to understand the metamorphism of pelitic rocks in totality. And we have seen that although broadly speaking, the concept of barrow uh, that was promulgated from the study of Scot Scottish rocks is applicable over a large areas in the world. And in India, we also describe Barovian type facies series from the Himalayas. So, and some other scientists also inferred about the Barovian facies series in Singbhum mobile belt as well. So, metamorphism of pelitic rocks is a really a complicated situation. You need to look at the rock, you need to look at its composition, you need to look, understand the terrain so that uh, you can get a holistic picture. I hope that this was helpful. Thank you very much.